section nine of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter eight part one cruise in the schooner in search of the missing midshipmen call at saba and find higson discover the wreck of the drodger deserted return unsuccessful the midshipmen mourned as lost the frigate and corvette sail for jamaica a boy overboard a hurricane at sea the corvette dismasted the next day and the next passed the drodger did not appear and the two captains became as anxious as were the three lieutenants to ascertain the fate of their midshipmen if you wish to go i will spare you for a few days said captain hemming to adair accordingly all three sailed in the swordfish having ascertained that the midshipmen intended visiting barbuda they first steered for that island there was a good stiff breeze and as the swordfish was a fast craft she rapidly ran over the thirty miles of water which intervenes between antigua and its small dependency it was not however all plain sailing as numerous shoals reefs and rocks surround the island mostly below the surface some only showing their black pates while from its slight elevation above the ocean at the distance of less than four miles it was scarcely visible a negro standing on the bowsprit end and holding on by the stay piloted the schooner giving his directions to the man at the helm in a sharp loud voice la may all oo can steady starboard keep her away steady lub 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 for oo life he screamed out waving his hand to enforce his orders the schooner just scraped clear of a rock round which the water hissed and bubbled and the pilot once more subsided into his ordinary calmness not a pleasant spot to find under one's lee in a gale of wind on a dark night observed terence it proves however that the crew of the drodger must have been sober or they could not have found their way clear of it the schooner at length came to an anchor and a messenger was sent off to the overseer who kindly came down at once and told them that he had seen the drodger outside the reefs and standing to the westward he pressed them to remain and partake of such hospitality as he could offer but eager to pursue their search they declined his invitation and the schooner was quickly again threading her way amid the shoals out to sea it was a question whether the drodger had continued her course due west or had steered northward to st bart's or southward to st eustatia or st kitts they finally decided after examining the chart to stand to the westward and call off saba as they approached the island a fishing-boat was seen standing out towards the schooner which was therefore hove to to let her come alongside i see higson and some of the others but all i fear are not there said jack who had been watching the boat through his glass in a tone which showed his anxiety higson was soon on board he gave a full account of what had happened i would sooner have lost my own life than allowed any harm to happen to the youngsters he added still i have hopes that they may have escaped needham is a prime seaman and he will have done what was possible to keep the drodger afloat though they were sadly short-handed i own still if the craft has not foundered as they had plenty of provisions and water aboard we may expect to see them again not the worse for their cruise we have all been on the lookout hoping to see her beating up to the island you will not blame me mr rogers more than i deserve and i couldn't help it you may depend on that 
the old maid as he spoke well nigh burst into tears jack and the other lieutenants assured him that they did not see how he could be blamed and they then set to work to consider what was best to be done they first compared notes and agreed as to the course of the hurricane and calculated the direction in which the drogher must have been driven and the distance she had probably gone recollecting that as she had been carried with the wind she must have been exposed to his fury for a much longer time than those on shore if it had not been for that they ought to have made their way back long before this observed jack perhaps they have gone to st eustatia or st kitts remarked murray i'm very sure sir that for our sakes they would have done their best to make saba said higson if they could have helped it they would not have deserted us jack as senior officer had to decide and he determined therefore to steer to the southwest for a couple of days keeping a bright lookout on either hand and then to beat back to antigua thus going over a wide extent of sea it would occupy them a week or more but captain hemming they knew would not object to the delay captain quasho and his crew as a punishment were left to find their way back as best they could and the schooner stood away in the direction proposed during the day higson or one of the midshipmen was at the masthead keeping a lookout on every side at night sail was shortened and the schooner stood backwards and forwards now to the northward now to the southward so that no risk might be run of passing the drogher in the dark three or four vessels were fallen in with but the same answer was received from all they had seen nothing of the missing craft under other circumstances they would have been very jolly for they had a good supply of west indian delicacies put on board by the owner of the vessel and had nothing to do but to eat and smoke when they felt inclined but they were much too anxious to enjoy themselves for another whole day they stood on still not a sign of the drogher jack felt greatly inclined to continue the search for a third day he reflected however on the risk of doing so it would take very much longer beating back and should light winds prevail they might run short of water and provisions and though he was ready to undergo any dangers himself with the prospect of recovering his brother he had no right he felt to expose others to them there was also the possibility of having to encounter another hurricane which might try the schooner capital sea-boat as she appeared to be the weather had again become threatening dark clouds collected overhead the wind fell and as the little vessel lay roiling her sides under the glass like swell down came the rain not a mere sprinkling like that of northern latitudes but in a perfect deluge the huge drops leaping up as they fell and flooding the deck those who could took refuge below the rest were wet to the skin before they could get on their great coats just before sunset a breeze sprang up and the clouds clearing away left the horizon more defined and distinct even than usual jack himself went aloft to take a look round and consider whether he should haul up at once and commence the long beat to antigua or stand on for a few hours longer he had already swept his glass round on every side when as he turned it once more towards the southwest, just clear of the setting sun his eye fell on a dark object almost on the very verge of the horizon it seemed a mere speck though it might he thought be a dead whale or a piece of wreck or only a mass of floating seaweed his directions to the man at the helm to steer for it called all hands on deck and several came aloft various opinions were expressed old higson was positive that it was part of a wreck of some unfortunate vessel lost in the late hurricane or the whole hull of a small craft dismasted the breeze freshened and hopes were entertained that they might get up to it before darkness settled down over the deep 
it could soon be seen from the deck i knew that i was right and i wish from my soul i wasn't exclaimed higson as he looked steadily through his glass that's a small craft on her beam ends and it's my belief that she's the snapper i trust not said rogers who overheard him if she is the snapper what has become of the poor youngsters perhaps they are still clinging to her sir answered higson i have known men hold out on board a craft in as bad a position as she is in but they are boys and must have succumbed to hunger and thirst even if they escape being washed overboard when the craft capsized observed murray who was not inclined just then to take a hopeful view of matters i'd trust to my nephew holding out as long as any youngster ever did said adair the others have not less pluck in them i see no signal and as they must have made us out long ago if they were aboard i fear they are gone sighed jack faith it's likely enough they have nothing to make one with observed adair i'll not believe they are lost every glass on board was continually kept turned towards the object ahead as the schooner approached however no one could be discovered on board it was nearly dark by the time she got up with it several voices on board the schooner hailed but no reply came she hove to and a boat was lowered jack terence and higson jumped into her hand a lantern here cried higson as they were shoving off they were quickly alongside the hapless craft it was then seen that she had been capsized with her sails set which with the mast and rigging assisted to keep her in her present position probably also her ballast having shifted contributed to do so as she was only partially filled with water not a human being however was visible higson seizing the lantern leaped on board and climbed up to the companion hatch jack and adair were about to follow but they observing that even his weight made the water flow over the bulwarks saw that it would be more prudent to let him search alone they waited for him anxiously he quickly put his head up the hatchway she's the snapper no doubt about that but there's not a soul aft he exclaimed at all events however they were not starved for there are plenty of provisions in the locker having let himself down into the hold holding on to the combing with one hand he stretched out the other with the lantern so as to let its light fall on every side no one was there he then made his way into the forepeak it seemed to jack that he was a long time absent though in reality scarcely a minute passed before he scrambled out again what has become of the youngsters i can't say but on board this craft they are not nor is there monkey spider who with his long tail to hold on by was not likely to be washed overboard he exclaimed as he sprang back into the boat the sooner we shove off the better for she is filling fast and may go to the bottom at any moment i can't bear to leave her though without having a look round said jack taking the lantern from higson he made his way into the little cabin and was soon convinced that higson was right not a trace of the midshipman could he see he searched the hold and the forepeak they were not there dead or alive jack came back to the boat and sat down feeling very sorrowful let me go in again said the old mate as he took the lantern he was back very soon with three small carpet-bags in his hand be sharp cried adair she is going down he spoke truly higson made a leap into the boat which shoved off just as the drodger giving a slight roll sank from sight the crew pulled away from her i could only find my own and two other fellows bags said higson the others must have slipped down into the water the boat at once returned to the schooner with the sad intelligence norris and the master's assistants were very glad to get back their carpet-bags their recovery it is possible somewhat consoled them for the loss of their young messmates they at all events congratulated themselves that they had not been on board the drogher when she was blown away from saba 
jack who loved his brother dearly was very much grieved at his loss so was terence for gerald though he thought most of the sorrow his sister would suffer when she heard of her boy's death arrah now i wish that i'd let him stay at home and turn farmer but then to be sure he might have been after breaking his neck out hunting so it comes to the same thing in the end he exclaimed with as near an approach to a sigh as he ever uttered och a home poor noah the sweet crater and i not able to bring her back the boy murray was less demonstrative but he knew that young archy would be truly mourned for in his distant highland home the schooner now commenced her long beat back to antigua there was every prospect of its being a tedious business but there was a fresh breeze and by carrying on though the top mast bent like willow wands english harbour was gained at length captain hemming felt the loss of his midshipmen but when the matter was explained to him he acquitted old higson of all blame only i will never as long as i command a ship allow my midshipmen to go away for their amusement by themselves he observed they run risks enough as it is in the course of duty this being reported in the berth made norris and others very angry and they were much inclined to abuse poor tom and gerald for getting drowned and thus being the cause of the restriction likely to be placed on their liberty the two ships were now ready for sea murray went to pay a farewell visit to the houghtons kind mrs houghton who for stella's sake as well as his own took a warm interest in him for she having keener eyes than the colonel knew perfectly well that they were engaged had letters of introduction ready to her daughter mrs raven to the bradshaw stella's relatives and to other friends you'll receive a hearty welcome and i have just hinted how matters stand they agree with us that the colonel has no right to be dragging his daughter about in the way he does and will be thankful to see her placed under the guardianship of one who will take better care of her than in my humble opinion her father does alick was duly grateful and said all that was proper though he wished that his friend had not mentioned the matter she alluded to as he felt somewhat nervous at the thought of appearing before strangers in the character of a melancholy lover however if there are any young ladies among them they'll not expect me to pay them attentions he thought the frigate and corvette were at sea with the prospect of a quick run to port royal during his quiet night watches alick's thoughts were ever occupied with stella hitherto the weather since she sailed had been unusually fine and she might he hoped have escaped the dangers of the sea but there were others to which she was too likely to be exposed on board a vessel engaged as he understood the brig was in landing arms and ammunition and in running contraband goods the colonel himself murray fully believed had nothing to do with such proceedings but he would notwithstanding be placed in a dangerous position should the vessel be captured while so employed and then to what a fearful risk might not stella be exposed he shuddered at the thought again and again it occurred to him the two ships had got to the southward of st domingo in those piping times of peace there was very little excitement at sea no enemy to be encountered no vessels to be chased except perhaps a slaver from the coast of africa there had however been a steady breeze all sail being carried and the officers were congratulating themselves on making a quick passage when about noon it suddenly fell calm the sun struck down from the cloudless sky with intense heat making the pitch in the seams of the deck bubble up and run over the white planks while every particle of iron or brass felt as hot as if just come out of a furnace the chips from the carpenter's bench floated alongside and the slush from the cook's pots scarcely mingled with the clear water till a huge mouth rising to the surface swallowed the mass down with a gulp creating a ripple which extended far away from the ship's side 
the atmosphere was sultry and oppressive in the extreme for air there was none it was a question whether it was hotter on deck in the shade or below in the sun there was not much doubt about the matter the sails hung motionless against the masts even the dog vanes refused to move the smoke ascending from the galley fire rose in a thin column till gradually spreading out it hung like a canopy above the ship the men moved sluggishly about their duties with no elasticity in their steps and even jack and adair the briskest of the brisk felt scarcely able to drag their feet after them the ocean was like a sheet of burnished silver so dazzling that it pained the eye to gaze at it ever and anon its polished surface would be broken by a cubby of flying fish rising into the air in a vain effort to escape some hungry foe a nautilus or portuguese man-of-war would glide by proving that the wind had nothing to do with its movement or the dark triangular fin of a shark might be seen as the monster with savage eye moved slowly round the ship watching for anything hove overboard woe betide the careless seaman who might lose his balance aloft and drop within reach of the creature's jaws in spite of the heat several of the ship's boys rather than remain stewing below or roasting on deck were skylarking in the fore rigging chasing each other into the top or up to the cross trees and along the yards now swarming up by a lift now sliding down a stay the most active of the boys and generally their leader though one of the smallest was jerry knott he had been over the masthead several times keeping well before the rest when he made his way out to the end of the starboard fore yard arm at that moment mr scrofton the boatswain coming on deck and reflecting probably that having been deprived of their tails they were not as fit as their ancestral monkeys to amuse themselves as they were doing and might come to grief called the youngsters down jerry startled by the boatswain's voice cast his eye on deck instead of fixing it on the topping lift a small body was seen falling and a splash was heard man overboard shouted numerous voices lower the starboard quarter boat cried jack rogers who was officer of the watch and having given the order he rushed forward and had sprung into the main chains intending to jump overboard and support the boy till the boat could pick them up when he saw the youngster throw up his arms a piercing shriek rent the air that bright face a moment before turned towards him had disappeared a ruddy circle marking the spot where it had been with difficulty he restrained the impulse which had prompted him to leap into the water to which had he given way he knew that he would probably have shared the fate of the poor boy the boat notwithstanding was lowered and the men rowed round and round the spot hoping to get a blow at their foe with the boat-hook and an axe with which one of them had armed himself but neither the shark nor his hapless victim again appeared the only thing which came to the surface was jerry's straw hat crushed and blood-stained the heat increased the sun itself seemed to grow larger the sky became of a metallic tint the sea lost its silvery brilliancy and gradually assumed the hue of molten lead the captain having several times examined his barometer came on deck all hands shorten sail he shouted out and while the boatswain was turning up the crew he ordered a signal to be made to the corvette to follow his example the topmen swarmed on the yards the idlers were at their stations be smart about it lads he shouted in a few minutes every sail was furled with the exception of a closely reefed fore topsail braced sharp up royal and topgallant yards were sent down and the masts struck the captain made another signal to the corvette to hasten her proceedings but her commander showed but little disposition to do so 
what's hemming making such a fuss about he was reported to have said why the sea is as smooth as a mill-pond and if a strong breeze does spring up on a sudden which i have my doubts about we shall have plenty of time to trim sails i should think i ought to know how to take care of my own ship and don't require to be dictated to by a young fellow who wore long clothes when i was a lieutenant captain hemming in the meantime as he walked the deck of the frigate ever and anon cast a vexed glance at the corvette babbicome will be having his sticks about his ears if he does not look sharp he muttered obstinate old donkey were it not for those with him i should be glad to see him receive the lesson he'll get to a certainty still not a breath of air stirred the dog veins the ocean remained as glass-like as before but thick clouds appeared in the north and in a short time rain began to fall it soon ceased and a stillness like death succeeded the pattering sound of the following drops on a sudden the dark clouds seen before in the distance covered the sky except in the zenith where an obscure circle of imperfect light was visible while a dismal darkness gathered round the ships the midshipmen of the frigate and several others had begun to think the captain over cautious one would suppose that he had changed places with old babbicome observed norris see they are letting all stand on board the corvette no they are not though see there's hands aloft shorten sail exclaimed higson good reason too they must be smart about it look there he pointed to the north-east where a long white line was seen sweeping on towards the ship and rapidly increasing in height and thickness while a roar like that of distant thunder was heard yet more shrill than thunder the sound every instant becoming louder and shriller till it seemed like that of countless voices screaming at their highest pitch on came the breath of the mighty hurricane not seen except by its effect on the ocean which now began to leap and foam rising into huge rolling billows sweeping along in threatening array the foam which flew from them forming one vast sheet covering the ocean while vivid lightning bursting from the clouds flashed in all directions with dazzling brilliancy the furious wind struck the frigate on her broadside in a moment over she heeled and the close reefed fore topsail blown out of the bolt ropes fluttered wildly in shreds which speedily lashed and twisted themselves round the yard the helm was put up after a struggle the frigate answered to it and off she flew before the wind passing close under the stern of the corvette which lay with her masts gone on her beam ends the sheets of foam sweeping over her almost concealing her from sight the crew of the corvette had been swarming aloft and some had already laid out on the yards when the hurricane struck her over she heeled the tall masts bending like willow wands the sheets were let fly but it was too late the men called down by the officers endeavoured to spring back into the tops and those who could descended on deck but many had no time to escape in one instant it seemed the three masts with a fearful crash went by the board carrying all on them into the seething ocean and the lately trim corvette lay a helpless meek exposed to the fury of the raging which dashed with relentless fury over her efforts were made by those on deck to rescue their drowning shipmates whose piercing shrieks for help rose even above the loud uproar of the tempest whose shrill voice seemed to mock their cries some few were hauled on board but many were swept away before aid could be rendered to them the masts also were thundering with terrific force against the side threatening every moment to stave in the stout planks and to send the ship and all on board to the bottom 
to clear the wreck was the first imperative work to be performed murray followed by a party of men armed with axes sprang into the main chains to cut away the main rigging while other officers were similarly engaged on that of the fore and mizzen masts he saw at that instant the captain of the main top a fine young seaman who was at his station when the mast went still clinging to it a cask with a line was hove into the sea in the hopes that it might reach him but this the mass of spars and sails rendered impossible murray shouted to him to try and make his way along the mast no no he answered in return knowing that he would be washed off should he venture on the attempt cut cut the reiterated blows of the butt ends of the masts allowed of no alternative the bright axes gleamed while the seamen rapidly cut the ropes as the last shroud was severed the gallant topman waved his hand a farewell to his shipmates and a faint cheer reached their ears as the tangled mass of spars rigging and sails floated away clear of the ship they had already however committed fearful damage the carpenter sounded the well he reported six feet of water the pumps were rigged and the hands set to work to try and overcome the leak while he and his mates went below to ascertain the locality of the injury the ship had received meantime the hatches were battened down to prevent the water from the seas which broke on board increasing the mischief end of section nine section ten of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter eight part two man lost dangerous position of corvette the frigate prepared weathers the hurricane anxiety about the corvette the frigate search for her before long the carpenter returned his countenance showing the anxiety he vainly endeavoured to conceal there are more leaks than one sir through which the water is rushing in like a mill sluice and it's more than man can do to stop them from within board he said coming aft to the commander you'll pardon me sir but it's my duty to say that unless we heave the guns overboard with everything else to lighten the ship and can get a thrummed sail under her bottom she'll founder before the world is many minutes older very well mr auger i'll consider what you say answered commander babbicome who though obstinate and irritable under ordinary circumstances was cool enough in moments of danger murray who had been below confirmed the carpenter's report the boatswain was ordered to get a sail up and prepare it as proposed while the drummer beat to quarters gladly would the crew have mustered had it been to meet an enemy but it was to perform a task the most painful of all to a man-of-war's man and one of no small danger heave the guns overboard shouted the commander watch the right time now as the dismasted ship rolled in the foaming seas raging around her first the guns on one side were allowed to slip through the ports then those on the other went plunging into the deep the anchors were next cut away from the bows and now the attempt was made to get the thrum sail under the ship's bottom it seemed well nigh hopeless with the ship rolling and the heavy seas breaking over her murray and the other officers lay as hard as any one setting an example by their energy and courage to the men dispirited by the loss of so many of their shipmates two hawsers were at length got under the ship's bottom when the sail filled with oakum was hauled over the part where the worst leaks were supposed to exist 
still the water rushed in the efforts of the hands at the pumps were redoubled and anxious eyes were turned towards the frigate which could still be dimly seen to leeward but too far off to render them any assistance should the sea overcome all their efforts and carry the ship to the bottom that this would be her fate before long seemed too probable the bulwarks in many places had been crushed in the boat stove or carried away scarcely a spare spar remained everything on deck had been swept off it indeed it seemed a wonder that she should still be afloat a short jury-mast was got up fixed to the stump of the foremast and a spare royal was bent to a yard and hoisted in the hopes of getting the ship before the wind but scarcely had the sail been sheeted home before it had produced the slightest effect than away went the canvas mast and spar to leeward a second attempt to set a sail was made with similar want of success and now not an available spar remained on which another could be hoisted spell ho was cried more frequently than at first as the exhausted hands at the pumps summoned their shipmates to relieve them when they staggered to the stumps of the masts or the remaining stanchions and bulwarks to which they clung to save themselves from being borne away by the wild surges as they broke on board thus the disastrous day wore on to be followed by a still more fearful night even the most hopeful had no expectation of seeing another sunrise as the increasing darkness told them that it had sunk into the storm-tossed ocean alec murray had endeavoured to maintain that calmness of mind one of the characteristics for which he was noted thought however was busy he like the rest believed that ere long the fierce waves would sweep over the foundering ship and his life with the lives of all on board would be brought to a close for who could hope to escape with not a boat remaining uninjured and scarcely a spar to afford support one thought however afforded him consolation the brig with his beloved stella on board had long ere this got well to the southward of the latitude the hurricane was likely to reach and she at all events would escape its fury earnestly he prayed that she might be protected from the many dangers she might have to encounter and though he knew she would mourn his loss that she might find comfort and be restored in time to happiness the rage of the hurricane was unabated a dreadful darkness settled down over the deep the only objects to be seen beyond the deck of the labouring ship being the black mountainous seas crested with hissing foam which rose up on either beam threatening every instant to overwhelm her in the meantime the frigate well prepared as she had been to encounter the first onslaught of the hurricane flew before it unharmed as she passed the corvette captain hemming seeing her perilous condition hailed promising to heave to if possible and lay by her but the wild uproar of the elements drowned his voice to bring the ship to the wind under the full force of the hurricane was indeed a difficult and dangerous operation which only the urgent necessity of the case rendered allowable the captain of the plantagenet was not the man to desert a consort in distress and notwithstanding the risk to be run he determined to make the attempt still some time elapsed before the trysails could be set and during it the frigate had run considerably to leeward of the corvette the ports were closed the hatches secured preventers stays set up every device indeed which good seamanship could suggest was adopted to provide for the safety of the ship the boats were secured by additional lashings as was everything that could be washed away on deck relieving tackles were also rove and four of the best hands were sent to the helm the crew were at their stations ready to carry out the intended operation all was ready but it was necessary to wait for an opportunity to avoid the fury of the mountain foam-crested billows rolling in quick 
succession across the ocean one of which striking her bows as she came up to the wind would have treated the proud frigate with little less ceremony than they would a mere cock-boat even during the fiercest gale there are spots on the surface of the sea which are less agitated than elsewhere while at times there comes a lull of the wind often the precursor however of a more furious blast for such a lull the captain waited it came helms a lee he shouted with a mighty struggle the frigate came to the wind the main and mizzen trysails were sheeted home the fore topsail was braced sharp up every one looked with anxiety towards the next huge sea which came roaring towards the frigate to observe how she would behave most gallantly she breasted it though its hissing crest burst over the bulwarks and came rushing furiously aft along the deck but the lee ports being opened the water made its way out again without committing any serious damage to bring the ship to the wind and heave to was one thing to beat her up to her hapless consort was another and that it was found impossible to do without the certainty of meeting with serious disaster in the attempt she would probably have missed stays and making a stern board would have gone down into the yawning gulf which the next passing sea would have left as it was though she rose buoyantly over most of the seas ever and anon the summit of one broke on board and all hands had to hold on fast to save themselves from being carried into the lee scuppers or washed overboard while at the same time it was evident that she must be making very considerable leeway and thus be drifting farther and farther from her consort jack and adair could not help feeling very anxious about the corvette for the sake of course of all on board but more especially on account of murray they had last seen her through a dense mass of spray with her masts gone and many of her crew struggling in the waves while the savage seas were breaking completely over her commander babbicome was very naturally not spoken of either by them or any one else in the most complimentary manner his stupid obstinacy has got his ship into this mess and as far as he is concerned he richly deserves it observed jack trying to catch a glimpse through his glass of the wreck as she rose in the far distance on the summit of a billow quickly again to disappear it's a sad fate for those poor fellows who have lost their lives and i am very much afraid that they will not be the only ones it's a question whether the corvette will weather out the hurricane i am very much afraid that she will not said adair if there was a prospect of a boat living i would volunteer to board her and try and save some of the people the best man boat wouldn't live a minute in such a sea as this so there's no use thinking about it answered jack i have tried to persuade myself that it might be possible but i know it is not all we can hope is that should she go down poor alec may manage to get hold of a plank or spar or into one of the boats and that when the gale moderates we may pick him up there is but a poor chance of that i own i'll hope that the corvette won't go down said adair she is a new ship and unless abominably managed she ought to weather out the hurricane she ought to have been put before the wind by this time and have followed us and see she has not altered her position since she was dismasted said jack with a sigh poor alec poor alec and poor stella echoed adair night came on few of the watch below officers or men turned in for every one knew that at any moment all hands might be piped on deck to save ship the hurricane continued to rage with unabated fury hour after hour went by without a sign of its ceasing the vivid lightning darted around the whole upper regions of the sky being illuminated by incessant flashes while darts of electric fire exploded with surpassing brilliancy in every direction threatening each instant the destruction of the ship 
jack and terence were standing together holding on to a stanchion when the latter gave a loud cry and some heavy object fell at their feet hello what's that exclaimed paddy as he put up his hand to his cap faith i thought a round shot had taken my head off catch it jack or it will be away what your head terence asked jack unable to restrain a joke even then no but that big bird there see it's scuttling away along the deck jack sprang forward and caught the bird which proved to be a large sea-fowl but he had not the heart to injure it presently another dropped on the deck near them and in a short time a flash of lightning spreading a bright glare around showed that the launch and booms and all the more sheltered spots were tenanted by sea-birds which unable to breast the storm could find no other resting-place for their weary wings some unfortunate ones were caught and carried captives below but the men generally showed compassion to the strangers and allowed them to enjoy such shelter as they could find undisturbed well i do hope that the hurricane is at its height observed jack as six bells in the middle watch were struck i doubt if the canvas will stand much more if it isn't it will be after blowing the ship herself clean out of the water answered adair we ought to be thankful that our sticks are sound and the rigging well set up yes cherry deserves full credit and we should give old scrofton his due for though his theories are nonsensical he is an excellent boatswain observed jack i am convinced that every accident on board a ship occurs from the carelessness and often from the culpable neglect of some one concerned in fitting her out or from bad seamanship while they were speaking there came a sudden lull of the wind and the lightning ceased leaving the ship enveloped in a blackness which could be felt the two lieutenants though close together could not even distinguish the outlines of each other's figures this is awful exclaimed adair jack felt that it was so but said nothing suddenly the whole heavens appeared ablaze with fiery meteors which fell in showers on every side look look mercy what can that be cried adair a mass of fire a globular form and deep red hue appeared high up in the sky when downward it fell perpendicularly not a cable's length from the ship it seemed assuming an elongated shape of dazzling whiteness ere it plunged hissing into the ocean we may be thankful that ball did not strike us observed jack it would have sent us to the bottom more certainly than fulton's torpedo or any similar invention could have done i hope that there are no others like it ready to fall on us said terence scarcely a minute had elapsed when the wind fell almost to a calm its strength being scarcely sufficient to steady the ship at the same moment the heavens seemed to open and shower down fire so numberless and rapid were the flashes of the most vivid lightning which played between the clouds and ocean filling the whole atmosphere with their brilliancy the captain had put his hand to his mouth to order more sail to be set when again the hurricane burst forth with renewed fury howling and shrieking as terence declared like ten legions of demons in the rigging while the mountain seas as they clashed with each other created a roar which almost overpowered the yelling voice of the hurricane for nearly an hour the hideous uproar continued until as if wearied by its last mighty effort the storm began evidently to abate although the darkness was even denser than before while the seas continued tumbling and rolling in so confused a manner that any attempt to steer the ship so as to avoid them would have been impossible daylight was looked for with anxiety by all on board to ascertain the fate of the corvette the captain eagerly waiting for the moment when he could venture to make sail that he might stand towards her just as the cold grey dawn broke over the leaden-tinted still tumbling ocean the wind shifted to the southward the light increased the eyes of all on deck were turned towards the spot where it was supposed the corvette would be seen in vain they looked she was nowhere visible a groan of disappointment escaped their breasts jack and adair hurried aloft with their glasses still in the hopes of discovering her they swept the whole horizon to the northward from east to west and every intermediate space but not a speck on the troubled waters could they discover which might prove to be the hull of the corvette poor alick poor 
alec they both again ejaculated and descended with sad hearts on deck the captain now gave the order to make sail and under her topsails and courses the frigate began to force her way amid the still rolling billows to the northward mr cherry and several of the other officers were speaking of the loss of the corvette as a certainty jack who could not bear the thought that murray was indeed gone declared that he still had some hopes of finding her above water i agree with rogers said the captain joining them we have made scarcely sufficient allowance for the distance the frigate has drifted during the hurricane though i allow that the corvette will have had a hard struggle for it and that it is too probable she has foundered yet as i think that there is a possibility of her being still afloat i intend to pass over every part of the sea to which she can have been driven or any boats or rafts escaping from her can have reached the remarks made by the captain considerably raised the spirits of jack and terence a lookout was sent to the masthead and they themselves frequently went aloft with their telescopes in the hopes of catching sight of the missing ship as the day advanced the light increased and the wind gradually fell to a moderate breeze the captain and mr cherry having been on deck during the whole night had turned in as had all who could do so jack had charge of the watch and terence remained with him a lump of something floating away on the starboard bow cried the lookout from aloft jack kept the ship towards it in a short time the object seen was discovered to be a tangled mass of spars and rigging evidently belonging to the corvette as the frigate passed close to it the figure of a seaman was perceived in its midst floating partly in the water and partly supported by a spar with his face turned upwards as if gazing at her several on board shouted but no voice replied no sign was made jack notwithstanding was about to shorten sail and heave the ship to that a boat might be lowered to rescue the man when the corpse for such it was turned slowly round and disappeared beneath the waves there goes poor bill dawson he was captain of the main top aboard the tudor observed one of the men i knowed him well and a better fellow never stepped jack's heart sank as he saw the wreck of the corvette's masts surely they could not have floated to any distance from her and as she is not in sight she must have gone down he thought the sea was still too rough to attempt taking any of the spars on board so the frigate stood on as the captain had directed ten minutes or more passed by when again the lookout hailed the deck in a cheery voice a sail on the port bow the announcement raised the spirits of every one terence hurried aloft and a midshipman was sent to call the captain who quickly appeared i thought so he explained depend on it that is the tudor some time passed before terence returned on deck his report confirmed the captain's opinion he could clearly make out the hull with a small sail set forward the last reef was shaken out of the topsails the starboard studding sails were set and the frigate dashed after the corvette the news spread below the sleepers were awakened and all hands turned out the frigate speedily came up with the lately trim little ship now reduced to a mere battered hulk from her appearance it was surprising that she should be still afloat a mast and yard composed of numerous pieces had been rigged forward with a royal or some other small sail set on it the whole of the bulwarks on one side were stove in not a gun remained the boats were gone many of the crew lay about the deck exhausted with fatigue and scarcely able to raise themselves and utter a faint cheer as the frigate now shortening sail approached while the remainder were labouring hard at the pumps and by the gush of water flowing from the scuppers it was evident that they found it a hard matter to keep the ship afloat shorten sail commander babacom and i'll send you assistance for i see you require it shouted captain hemming with a touch of irony in his tone as the frigate ranged up alongside 
a hawser had been got ready and passed aft a long line secured to the end was hove on board the corvette and those who just before seemed scarcely able to stand on their feet hauling on it with right good will the hawser was passed forward and quickly secured in the meantime two boats had been lowered and fifty fresh hands sent from the frigate relieved the worn-out crew of the corvette adair had gone in charge of the men and murray was the first person he greeted on deck we had given you up for lost but thank heaven you are safe exclaimed terence as he warmly wrung his friend's hand it isn't the first time either that we've had cause to be frightened about each other's safety and for my part i intend in future should you or jack disappear never to despair of seeing you turn up again alive somewhere or other we have indeed been very mercifully preserved answered murray gravely but my dear adair unless we take the greatest care i very much doubt that the ship can be kept afloat till we reach port royal and he briefly told terence all that had occurred there was but little time however for conversation while most of the fresh hands went to the pumps the rest got up another sail which having been thrummed like the first was passed under the ship's bottom the result was satisfactory though the frigate was towing the corvette at the rate of four knots an hour instead of the leak increasing as had been feared would be the case the pumps rapidly gained on it higson with additional hands came on board the hatches were taken off and buckets being brought into play passed rapidly up from below by a line of men the depth of water in the hold was sensibly decreased the corvette in consequence towing the lighter poor commander babacombe who looked as unhappy as a man could do went to his cabin and even murray with most of the officers was glad to turn in and leave the ship in charge of adair and fligson happily the wind remained fair and moderate and in three days the frigate and her battered consort came safely to an anchor in the magnificent harbour of port royal their arrival was officially notified to the admiral living at the pen above kingston and he shortly after coming down in his barge having inspected the ships ordered the corvette into dock to be repaired while he gave a gentle hint to commander babacombe that as he was not a good subject for resisting an attack of yellow fever it would be wise in him to return by the first opportunity to england End of chapter eight section eleven of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter nine jamaica murray appointed to the supple jack brig pull up to kingston port royal jack johnny farong's store visit to the bradshaws kind reception return the supple jack sails for the southward jamaica a hundred and sixty miles long by forty-five broad is as everybody knows a very magnificent island but alas its ancient glory has departed for a time though it is to be hoped that one of the many panaceas proposed for its renovation may ere long restore it to its pristine state of prosperity port royal or kingston harbour capable of holding a thousand tall ships lies on its southern side towards its eastern end the harbour has for its sea boundary a low narrow sandy strip of land several miles in length called the palisades running from the east towards the west at which end is seen the town of port royal standing a few feet above the water and looking complacently down on its predecessor buried eight fathoms below the surface by the earthquake of sixteen ninety two here too is the royal naval yard hospital barracks and the works of fort charles defending the entrance 
which is rendered still more difficult of access to an enemy by the apostle's battery erected on the opposite side with a fine range of mountains rising directly above it kingston that not over delectable of seaport stands on the northern shore of the harbour towards its eastern end and is thus a considerable distance from port royal the only communication between the two places being by water except by a circuitous route along the burning sands of the palisades which adventurous mids and juvenile subs have alone of mortals been known to attempt on horseback the land rises rapidly beyond the flat on which kingston stands the admiral's pen being some way above it while uphill barracks appear beautifully situated very much higher up the mountain the frigate lay at anchor off port royal the crippled corvette had just been towed into dock jack and terence were walking the deck under the awning having got ready to go on shore faith now this is a fine place exclaimed terence as he gazed over the wide expanse of the harbour the plain of luguania covered with plantations and dotted with white farmhouses quivering in the beams of a tropical sun beyond it rose the magnificent amphitheatre of the blue mountains one piled upon another reaching to the clouds and intersected by numerous deep irregular valleys one of their spurs with rock fort at its base appearing directly over the ship's port quarter while before the beam was seen at the end of a narrow spit of sand fort augusta its guns ready to sweep to destruction any hostile fleet which might attempt to enter and over the bow in the far distance could dimly be distinguished the town of kingston at the head of the lagoon not equal to drinidad though observed jack i don't know what your fair cousin maria would say if she heard you expatiate so warmly on its beauties i'd just invite her to come with me and judge for herself answered terence but why did you speak of her now i was beginning to fancy that i was getting the sweet creature out of my head for it's bothering me she has been ever since we left the island oh jack you're a hard-hearted fellow i thought that you would have fallen head over ears in love with stella i saw that miss o'regan was not likely to fall in love with me and besides for other reasons when i found how completely murray was captivated by her i soon conquered the admiration i felt said jack i wish for his sake that they had never met dragged about as she is by her enthusiast of a father into all sorts of dangers it is impossible to say what may be her fate and it would go nigh to break his heart should her life be lost or any other misfortune happen to her here comes a shore boat we'll secure her to take us to kingston jack going to the gangway met the very person they had just been speaking of why murray my dear fellow we expected to meet you on shore he exclaimed what brings you back to look after my trap settle my mess accounts bid farewell to my late shipmates and take command of his majesty's brig supplejack fitting out at the dockyard and nearly ready for sea i am told answered murray i don't know whether to ask you to congratulate me or not i had hoped to make the acquaintance of some families on shore to whom i have letters of introduction but as they live some way from kingston i fear that i shall not have time to call on them one family the ravens are related to my antigua friends the houghtons and another the bradshaws to the colonel o'regan and his daughter of whom i hope to hear from them i feel anxious on the subject i confess for there are rumours on shore about the character of the brig they sailed in which i do not like i wish that she was safe back again the brig or the young lady exclaimed terence ah yes i understand the brig with the young lady aboard i'd like to give her a royal salute as she comes in which i dare say will be before long and as to hearing about her jack and i will make a pilgrimage to the ravens and bradshaws and bring you back all the intelligence we can collect if you haven't time to go yourself 
you may depend on us for that said jack but i say alick you haven't told us by what good fortune you have been appointed to the supplejack for good fortune i call it to get an independent command whatever you may think by no unusual means through what i suspect the invidious will call nepotism when i went to pay my respects to the admiral he at once hailed me as a cousin told me he was glad to make my acquaintance expressed his regret at the loss of poor archy who was also related to him and wound up by saying that he should be very happy to forward my interests i was taking my leave wishing to get on to the bradshaws when he stopped me inviting me to dinner and observing that he should by that time have something to say to me and wished besides to hear about old friends in bonny scotland this of course was equivalent to a royal command so i wrote to mrs bradshaw enclosing my letter of introduction and expressing my intention of calling on her and mrs raven as soon as i was at liberty you and terence will i have no doubt be welcomed if you can ride over to st david's you can explain more clearly than i could by letter how i am situated and you will not fail to inquire what has been heard about the o'regans after dinner the admiral who spoke in the kindest way possible said that macleod who he had intended should have command of the supplejack having been invalided as the corvette could not be refitted under three or four months he had appointed me in his stead and that he intended to transfer thirty of the corvette's crew to the brig with any officers i might name though i must consider my command but temporary i may possibly he hinted be confirmed in it congratulate you of course i do and though i'm not jealous it's just the sort of command i should jump at exclaimed terence i'm not quite so certain it is said that if a lieutenant is placed in command of a small craft he is never likely to get anything better observed jack however in your case it is different as the admiral will look after your interests did he tell you how and where you are to be employed my duty will be chiefly to look after slaves and pirates of whom a few occasionally appear sailing under the flags of some of the smaller south american states he mentioned also that i might probably be sent to the spanish main to protect british interests on that coast my thoughts at once i confess flew to colonel o'regan and his daughter and the possibility of meeting them though i trust that they may have returned safely to jamaica before i can get to the coast who knows by my faith i should be after wishing the contrary exclaimed terence what a romantic incident it would be now some morning just as day breaks to make out a way to leeward a brig which you have no doubt is the sarah jane with a black rakish wicked-looking schooner close to just opening fire the brig fights bravely she had i think a couple of two or three pounders on board but she will to a certainty be captured you make all sail to her assistance for the pirate supposing you to be a merchantman doesn't up stick and run for it but the wind drops you take to your boats the black schooner has ranged up alongside the brig you arrive at the moment the brig's crew have been overpowered the colonel brought to the deck and the pirate captain a huge ugly negro is bearing off a fair lady in his arms you cut him down rescue the lady drive the pirates overboard place the colonel on his legs blow up the schooner and are duly rewarded for your gallantry avast terence with your nonsense exclaimed murray who had before been vainly endeavouring to stop the imaginative irishman you make me miserable in suggesting the bare possibility of such an occurrence the brig may be attacked but i might not arrive in time to save my friends now alick dear you remind me mightily of tim doolan the cowboy at ballymacree said terence i found tim one bright morning looking as unhappy as his twinkling eyes and cocked-up nose would let him tim my beauty what's the matter i asked it's a throubled drum mr terence that i have had answered tim twisting his nose and mouth about in a curious manner and giving a peculiar wink with his right eye what is it man i asked out with your dream 
well your honour it was just this i dreamt that i went to pay a visit to his holiness the pope and a civil old gentleman he was for he axed me if i'd take some whisky and water and on course i said yes hot or cold tim asked the pope hot your reverence says i and bad luck to me for my dad while the pope went down to the kitchen to get the kettle i awoke and now if i'd said cold i'd have had time to toss off a noggin full at last and it's that throubles me now it strikes me alick that your waking imagination is as vivid as tim's but don't let it run away with you in this instance you'll see the sarah jane come safe into the harbour before you leave it and have time to wish the young lady the top of the morning at all events you are incorrigible patty answered murray laughing in spite of himself as i have stood all your bantering i have the right to insist on your coming with me to inspect the supple jack before you go up to kingston his two friends of course agreed to the proposal and their carpet-bags being put into murray's boat they pulled for the dockyard at port royal the supplejack had her lower yards across and most of her stores on board in three or four days she might by an efficient crew be got ready for sea though murray would gladly have had a longer delay duty with him was paramount to every other consideration and he resolved to use every exertion to expedite her outfit she was not much of a beauty they were of opinion but she looked like a good sea boat and jack thought that she would prove a fast craft which was of the most consequence though rated as a six-gun brig she carried only two carronades and a third long heavy gun amidships which they agreed under some circumstances would be of more avail than the four short guns it had replaced terence advised alick to ask for two more carronades i might not get them if i did ask so i will make good use if i have the chance of those on board was the answer captain hemming had been requested to spare murray five hands from the frigate he chose ben snatchblock the boatswain's mate to act as boatswain a great promotion for ben and for others these with a dozen hands before belonging to the brig the rest having died of yellow fever sent home invalided or deserted made up his compliment he had applied for and obtained old higson a former shipmate who had so taken to heart the loss of the three midshipmen that he was anxious for more stirring employment than he could find on board the frigate likely to be detained for some time at jamaica or not to go much farther than cuba the other officers were selected from the corvette the old mate was highly pleased he had the duty of a first lieutenant and was one in all respects except in name though not to be sure over a very large ship's company hard drinker and careless as he had been sometimes on shore murray knew that he could trust him thoroughly when responsibility was thrown on his shoulders and hoped that by being raised in his own estimation he might altogether be weaned of his bad habits jack and terence sailed up to kingston with a fresh sea breeze abeam blowing over the sandy shore of the palisades take care you don't capsize us said jack to the black skipper who carried on till the boat's gunwale was almost under water never tink i do dat massa lieutenant not pleasant place to take swim answered the man with a broad grin on his ebon features showing his white teeth i think not indeed exclaimed terence look there he pointed to a huge shark its triangular fin just above the surface keeping two or three fathoms off even with the boat at which the monster every now and then as he declared gave a wicked leer what do you call that fellow dat massa dat is port royal jack answered the negro he keep watch ober de harbour cas buckra sailors swim ashore he no come up much fodder when he find out we boat from de shore see he go away now 
the shark gave a whisk with his tail and disappeared in an instant the young officers breathed more freely when their ill-omened companion had gone almost immediately afterwards a boat belonging to a large merchantman lying at the mouth of the harbour ready for sea passed them under all sail her crew of eight hands had evidently taken a parting glass with their friends dey carry too much canvas wid de grog dey hab aboard observed the black better look out for squalls he hailed but received only a taunting jeer in return and the boat sped on her course not a minute had passed when jack and terence heard the negro mate who was watching the boat sing out dere dey go jack shark get dem now eh looking in the direction the black's chin was pointing to their horror they saw that the boat had capsized her masts and sails appearing for an instant as she rapidly went to the bottom while the people were writhing and struggling on the surface shrieking out loudly for help jack and terence ordered the black to put the boat about instantly and go to their rescue nearly two minutes passed before they reached the spot five men only were floating the ensanguined hue of the water told too plainly what had been the fate of the others help help for god's sake help shrieked out a man near them in an agony of fear at that instant a white object was seen rising it seemed from the bottom the hapless man threw up his arms and uttering a piercing shriek disappeared beneath the water the other four men could swim but almost paralyzed with fear kept crying out for help without making any effort to save themselves striking out wildly round and round as if they did not see the approaching boat first one was hauled on board then another and another jack had got hold of the fourth and was dragging him in when a shark rose from the bottom the negro boatman's quick eye had espied the monster he darted down his boat hook into the open mouth of the shark which closing its jaws bit off the iron and a part of the stock while by a violent effort jack and terence jerked the man inboard thus saving his legs and probably his life they were now directly over the spot where the boat went down and so clear was the water the ruddy stains having disappeared that they could see her as she lay at the bottom jack was standing up when he exclaimed there is a poor fellow entangled in the rigging he seems alive i think that i could bring him up influenced by a generous impulse and forgetting the fearful monsters in the neighbourhood he was on the point of leaping overboard when the black boatman seized his arm crying out no no massa dat one shark hisself jack looked again and the object he had mistaken for a seaman's white shirt resolved itself into the white belly of a shark the creature being employed in gnawing the throat of its victim dat is what dey always do observed the black coolly dey drag down by de feet and den dey begin to eat at de throat probably because the throat is the part of the body most exposed jack and terence carried the survivors up to kingston except that they uttered a few expressions of regret at the sad fate of their shipmates the men seemed very little concerned or grateful to heaven for their own preservation and immediately on landing they went into a grog shop where they probably soon forgot all about the matter such is the force of habit jack and terence were not enchanted with the silent half-deserted streets of kingston through which having lost their way they paraded for half an hour or more but after eating a pink-coloured shaddock and a half a dozen juicy oranges obtained from a smiling-faced negress market-woman their spirits rose things begin to wear a more roseate hue may be tinged with the juice of the fruit we've swallowed said terence laughing and here's johnny farong's store we were looking for i've no doubt they entered and received a hearty welcome from that most loquacious and facetious of frenchmen who offered to supply them with every possible article they could require in any quantity from a needle to an anchor 
they wanted something it was information how best to get out to st david's not a profitable article to supply them with but johnny ferong afforded it with apparently infinite pleasure and further assisted to raise their spirits and confirm their resolution of becoming customers by handing them each a glass of cool sparkling champagne and immediately replenishing it when empty and you want to pay visit to madame bradshaw charmant lady den i vill order one voiture for vous vich vill take vous dare let me see in two hours and one half and vous stay dare and come back in de cool of de morning in de evening and de next day if vous please said mr ferong bowing and smiling as he spoke in the mode habitual to him it will never do to take people by storm in that fashion exclaimed jack unless we can get back to-night we had better put off our visit till to-morrow morning terence who was modesty itself in such a case agreed with him mr ferong however laughed at their scruples assuring them that mr and mrs bradshaw would be delighted to see them whether strangers or not that he would be answerable for all consequences and settle the matter by sending off a black boy to order the carriage forthwith and to fetch their carpet-bags from the inn where they had been deposited on landing in the meantime jack and terence found several acquaintances among the visitors chiefly naval and military officers assembled in johnny ferong's reception-room forming the lower story of his store or warehouse there were also a few merchant skippers and civilian agents of estates clerics and others countless glass cases exhibiting wares of all sorts and goods of every description in bales packages boxes and casks were piled up or scattered about the place serving for seats for the guests most of whom were smoking and sipping sangaree while jack was talking to an old shipmate he unexpectedly met a skipper and a merchant were engaged in an earnest conversation near him and he could not help overhearing some of the remarks which dropped from them if captain crowhurst can manage to run his cargo before the brig's character is suspected it will be an easy affair for him but if not he will find it a difficult job they have got half a dozen armed craft which will watch her pretty sharply and i know those mongrel spaniards well if they catch her they'll not scruple to sink her and shoot every man on board these remarks were made by the skipper but the sarah jane is a fast craft and will i should hope be able to keep out of their way said the merchant in an anxious voice we should be unable to recover her insurance should she be sunk i fear as certainly as the poor fellows who may be shot would be unable to come to life again observed the skipper dryly to my mind it's not fair to send men on such an adventure they are aware of what they are about and know the risk they run said the merchant the captain and supercargo may but not the rest of the people and that's what i find fault with observed the skipper jack heartily agreed with the last speaker and was on the point of turning round to make inquiries about the sarah jane when the merchant suspecting that they must have been overheard drew his companion aside and left the store jack asked mr ferong if he could give him the information he desired but the frenchman shrugging his shoulders replied that he knew nothing of the affairs of his customers his business was to obtain his little wares of the best quality and to sell them at the lowest price possible in a short time the carriage appeared with their carpet-bags strapped on behind and covered with a tarpaulin it was a species of gig with a seat in front for the driver and had two horses one in the shafts and the other prancing in comparative freedom secured by traces to an outrigger away they started at furious speed and before long were ascending the side of the magnificent laguania mountains now proceeding along a romantic valley with a babbling stream on one side now passing over a height now along a level or but slightly sloping spot for a half a mile or so but gradually getting higher and higher above the plain 
sometimes when exposed to the sun's rays they found it hot enough but frequently they travelled under the long shadow of some gigantic cotton tree shooting up into the blue heavens or beneath a grove of graceful palms the tendrils of the yam and granadillos climbing up them with fences on either side covered by numberless creepers passion flowers of varied sizes and convolvuli of countless descriptions the whole country seemed like an assemblage of orchards composed of orange trees and fruit and flower lemon and citron trees glossy leaved star apples the avocado with its huge pear and the bread fruit tree bearing still vaster fruit and leaves of proportionate size while beneath them were seen in abundance the unfailing food of man in tropical climes the ever cool fresh green plantain indeed the strangers felt bewildered amid the variety of trees shrubs and plants which surrounded them a perfect paradise this exclaimed jack who was not much addicted however thus to express his feelings see the vegetation reaches to the very summit of the highest mountains inhabited by no small number of ebon-hued adams and eves observed terence pointing to several palm-thatched whitewashed huts a little way off before which was collected a group of negroes men and women and children laughing shouting and talking looking wonderfully happy the former all neatly habited and though the smaller members of the community were not overburdened with clothing they looked as plump and jolly as need be i only wish that our peasantry in old ireland were as well off as these people seem to be and those of england also said jack still slavery is an abomination and i pray that it may some day cease throughout the world the lieutenants scarcely believed that the time they expected to be on the road had elapsed when their driver pointed to a wide-spreading low mansion with verandas all round it and extensive outbuildings and said dare dat st david's somehow or other they had expected to see only a mr and mrs bradshaw their surprise was considerable when they met with a reception not unlike that at trinidad from a matronly dame and a number of young damsels except that they did not claim adair as a relation we were expecting mr murray and regret not seeing him but his brother officers are most welcome said mrs bradshaw when she had glanced at alec's letter she then introduced the two lieutenants by name to her eldest daughter fanny and to her three little girls as she called them but though the youngest was barely thirteen they all looked like grown women adair was quickly at home with them answering the questions they showered on him jack remained talking to mrs bradshaw and fanny he mentioned murray's anxiety about the o'regans i fear that he has good reason to be anxious answered mrs bradshaw the colonel promised to bring his daughter here long ago and we were expecting to see her when we heard that he had carried her off on another of his wild expeditions he wrote word from antigua that he intended to be but a short time away so that they may possibly arrive in a day or two we long to have her safe with us for though fanny is the only one who knows her as they were at a finishing school together in england from the account she gives we are all prepared to love her yes indeed exclaimed fanny she was a delightful creature the pet and darling of the school one of the youngest among us and i should never have supposed that she would have been able to go through what she has done since while they were speaking mr bradshaw arrived a stout bald-headed middle-aged gentleman with ruddy countenance dressed in nankin trousers white jacket and broad-brimmed straw hat which he doffed as he approached the strangers glancing from one to the other and then having settled in his mind that jack rogers was alec murray shook his hand which he grasped with the greatest warmth happy to welcome you to st david's my dear sir only wish that our expected friends were here also a great disappointment to us and to you likewise i feel sure eh and he gave a facetious look at jack as much as to say i know all about it my dear this gentleman is lieutenant rogers mr murray has been unable to come up said mrs bradshaw and she explained how matters stood 
jack thought that he ought to speak of going back mr bradshaw laughed at the notion utterly out of the question stay a week or as long as you have leave send your shanredan back to-morrow morning and i'll drive you down in my buggy when you have to go thus pressed jack confessed that he and adair had brought their carpet bags not knowing where they might have to put up and accepted the invitation for the night but said that on murray's account they must return the next day to see him before he sailed and to tell him what they had heard respecting colonel and miss o'regan you may assure your friend that he will ever be welcome here and i hope that we shall have the young lady with us when he returns answered mr bradshaw i will not say the same with regard to her impracticable father for between you and i the farther he is away from her the better i am no admirer of his wild harem-scarum schemes though he is individually a brave and honourable man and had he not foolishly quarrelled with the authorities at home he would never have lacked employment under the flag of england instead of knocking his head against stone walls in quarrels not his own these remarks of the worthy planter explained colonel o'regan's character to jack more clearly than anything he had before heard he had before entertained some unpleasant suspicions on the subject they were confirmed and he now only hoped that murray would not should he marry stella be induced to join any of her father's schemes of that however if cautioned he did not think there was much risk had terence been the favoured lover the case would have been different for enthusiastic himself he might easily have been won over by the colonel's persuasive powers dinner was soon announced jack and terence who were very hungry did ample justice to the solids as well as to the numerous west indian delicacies and rich fruits pressed on them by their fair hostesses the shaddocks the mangoes and above all the granadillos which were pronounced like strawberries and cream but superior to any such mixture ever tasted in europe they enjoyed too a most pleasant evening several friends having come in among them mr and mrs raven nice young people full of life and spirits mrs raven was glad she said to make the acquaintance of lieutenant murray's brother officers of whom she had heard from her mother mrs houghton and only regretted that he himself was unable to come however she added we may hope to see him frequently by and by on his return from his cruise they had dancing of course as young people never think of meeting in the west indies without it and some delightful music for the younger girls had been taught by fanny who was highly accomplished mr bradshaw observed that they did pretty well considering that they had not the advantages of their elder sister times were changed in jamaica and he could not afford to pay three hundred a year for the education of each of them as he had done for her no but they are better housekeepers and understand far more about preserving and pickling than she does and there is not a bird or a flower on the estate or indeed in any part of the island with which they are not acquainted remarked mrs bradshaw with motherly pride thanks to fanny too they are really considering their ages not so very much behind her in book knowledge we need not regret having kept them with us i agree in all you say mrs b rejoined her husband rubbing his hands and laughing and as i am eighteen hundred pounds the richer or let me see in three years with the addition of their voyages and dress the cost of sending them home would have amounted to three thousand or more i do not complain i assure you the young officers listened with surprise and not a little amusement at this eulogium on the young ladies and the accompanying remarks uttered they believed correctly without any ulterior object it gave them some idea of the expense to which west indian parents were put for the education of their girls of which they before had no conception faith more than double a lieutenant's pay ejaculated terence as he was turning in at night if he would make that allowance to fanny the eldest of the three i'd do my best to win her before the ship sails i can't stand it jack i must either stay abroad and do duty for cherry or never set eyes on these huries again or knock under to one or the other 
there's luck in odd numbers says rory o'more answered jack from his side of the room you divided your attention very fairly among the young ladies and depend on it they will as easily forget us as we shall get them out of our heads by the time we have been a few days at sea so don't bother yourself about the matter patty but go to sleep whether or not terence followed his advice jack could not tell for he himself very soon went off into a sound slumber the house was astir at daybreak and not long after the white dresses and broad brim straw hats of the young ladies were seen in the garden amid the fragrant flowers with glittering humming-birds and gorgeous butterflies flitting about in all directions the lieutenants speedily joined them jack's wise resolutions were almost overcome he had made up his mind to take leave after breakfast they looked so bright and happy the air was so fresh the flowers so sweet he and terence could not fail to spend a pleasant day but then he remembered murray who would be anxiously looking for their return then you'll come again soon mr adair if mr rogers thinks you must go now said fanny with a strong emphasis on the must and a gentle sigh you will always be welcome at st david's added mr bradshaw and tell lieutenant murray that i will let him know should i hear anything about the sarah jane i may possibly get information which might not reach him their own vehicle not having started they returned to kingston in it well baked by the burning rays of the sun with a case of champagne and a few other articles obtained of johnny ferrong as presents to murray they returned in the evening to port royal alick thanked them heartily he had so zealously pushed forward the brig's equipment that she would be ready for sea the next day that very evening he received orders from the admiral to sail immediately if he could a dispatch had just arrived from the british consul at cartagena stating that disturbances had broken out in the country and requesting to have a man-of-war sent immediately for the protection of british subjects residing there and elsewhere along the coast captain hemming had been directed to send fifty hands from the frigate and with the assistance of rogers and adair by working all night the sails were bent and early next morning the brig glided out into the harbour the land wind still blew strong smelling of the hot earth albeit mixed with spicy odours murray was eager to be away his duty required him to use all speed he had also a feeling that he might be of service to those in whom he was so deeply interested he spoke of it to his friends second side eh alick said rogers i have no great faith in that but i am very sure that whatever has to be done you will do it thoroughly i wish that i could accompany you exclaimed adair if hemming would spare me i'd have my traps on board in a jiffy i should be glad of your company the admiral however in a private note says that he shall probably dispatch the frigate in a few days but he remarks that the brig will be of greater service by being able to enter the rivers and harbours which she cannot answered murray rogers and adair watched the supple jack as she glided out of the harbour under all sail to the southward before the wind till she met the sea breeze when hauling her tacks aboard she heeled over to it and stood away to the southwest her canvas gradually disappearing below the horizon jack and terence spent their time pleasantly enough on shore johnny ferrong's store being one of their favourite places of resort as it was of officers of all ranks captain hemming had made a rule that his midshipmen when they returned on board after leave should send in a written statement of the places and people they had visited he was much amused at the frequency of such entries as the following called on j ferrong's esq spent the evening at j ferrong's esq music and a hop sometimes added lunched at j frong's esq in those days jamaica flourished but alas her time came and so did that of the well-known highly esteemed johnny ferrong as the island went down he ceased to flourish and at length kingston knew him no more except as one of her departed worthies End of chapter nine section twelve of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings 
are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter ten cruise of the supplejack calms and heat a shark caught exercising at the guns a boat seen needham and one of the missing midshipmen found nearly dying from thirst they bring alarming information the supplejack was making the best of her way across the caribbean sea murray or one of his subordinates higson or jos green usually so called the second master of the corvette was ever on deck with watchful eyes on the bending topmasts carrying on as much sail as the brig could bear gallantly she slashed through the blue heaving seas a mass of white foam rising up round her bows and sheets of sparkling spray flying over her forecastle a bright lookout was kept on every side not in the expectation of meeting either with a slaver or pirate but the young commander could not help secretly hoping that he might fall in with the sarah jane and be relieved of his chief cause of anxiety his patience however on several occasions was sorely tried when the wind fell light one day too a perfect calm came on and the brig lay her sides lapping the glassy sea as she rolled in the slowly heaving sluggish swell and her sails flapped lazily against the masts in vain old higson whistled for a wind till his cheeks were ready to crack not that he really believed the proceeding would produce a breeze or that he had any notion of the origin of the custom but he had always done so when there was a calm and he wanted a wind and the wind if he whistled long enough always came the heat was oppressive as it always is under such circumstances in those latitudes the spirits of all fell except those of jos green who was ever merry blow high or blow low in sunshine or cold the grumblers grumbled of course but in lower tones than usual like the mutterings of distant thunder the phlegmatic became more supine the quarrelsome had not the energy to dispute the talkative was silent and even pat blathermouth who could usually spin a yarn which lasted from the beginning to eight bells in a watch and then wasn't half finished could scarcely draw out an oft-told tale which was wont to make his hearers burst their sides with laughter but now only sent them to sleep of course it's hot answered jolly jos to a remark of higson's what else would you have it here in the tropics with the bright sun striking down from the cloudless sky it has its advantages and it is better than cold and saves one the trouble of putting on more clothing than decency requires but it may be the harbinger of another hurricane and that wouldn't be pleasant observed higson no fear of a hurricane they seldom reach so far south answered jos wait patiently and we shall get the breeze before long if not what's the odds we are very happy as we are you're a salamander or you wouldn't say that growled higson just the very thing of all others it's most convenient to be just now answered jolly jos laughing it really isn't hotter than it has been often before only there are fewer hands to divide it amongst eh just do your turn in hig and forget your troubles in sleep i shall be stewed if i do moaned higson i've a great mind to have a swim it will be the last you'll ever take old fellow depend on that said green look there he pointed to the black fin of a huge shark which the next instant turning up its white belly opened its huge mouth to swallow the contents of the cook's slush bucket see jack has had his soup and will be ready for the next course which you proposed offering him thank you jos i've changed my mind said higson but i should not object to catch the fellow and take a slice out of him instead a stout 
hook with a bit of chain to the end of a strong line and baited with a piece of pork was quickly got ready even the most apathetic of the seamen were aroused with the hopes of capturing their hated foe a couple of running bowlines were prepared higson dropped the tempting morsel and let it sink down deep then rapidly drew it up again quick as lightning the shark darted at it and down his throat it went his jaws closing with a snap which made higson draw up his leg the monster's sharp teeth however could not bite through the chain haul away lads cried the old mate while ben snatchblock slipped a running bowline over the creature's head its tail coming to the surface he dexterously got another round it and in spite of its violent struggles it was hoisted on board stand clear of him lads shouted hickson though the men did not need the warning the crew seizing axes capstan bars and boarding pikes attacked the captive monster as it lay writhing on deck lashing out furiously with its tail and every now and then opening its huge jaws as if even then it had hopes of catching one of its assailants it showed what it could do by biting off the head of a boarding pike which ben thrust into its mouth with wild shouts the men sprang round it rushing in every now and then to give it a blow with an axe or capstan bar and leaping back again to avoid its tail for even though its head was nearly smashed in that continued striking out and lashing the deck as furiously as at first till higson came down on it with a well-aimed blow of his axe which instantly paralyzed it and it lay motionless we'll make sure lads he don't come to life again exclaimed ben as he set to work to chop off the tail the head was treated in the same way and a number of slices being cut off the body the remainder was thrown overboard murray wondering what the hubbub was about had come on deck and was an amused spectator of the scene the men no longer thought of the heat and in spite of it regaled themselves heartily on shark steaks at dinner the capture of the shark too brought them good luck they declared for a favourable breeze shortly afterwards sprang up and held till the northern coast of the south american continent was sighted before however cartagena the port at which murray had been directed to call first could be made it again fell calm he felt the delay very trying he had been eagerly hoping to get in by the evening to ascertain if anything had been heard of the sarah jane and now another whole day or more might pass before he could gain any information the coast lay in sight its ranges of light blue mountains looking like clouds rising above the horizon but proving that they were mountains by never altering their shape or position higson whistled as energetically as usual but not a cat's paw played over the surface of the mirror-like sea and not an inch nearer the shore did the brig move during the day the night passed by and the hot sun rose once more out of the still slumbering ocean the day wore on but no breeze came the men of course were not idle murray had from the first exercised them at their guns and especially in the use of the long one he remembered the advice admiral triton had given to jack rogers and which jack had repeated to him don't mind throwing a few rounds of shot away you'll make the better use of those you have remaining he accordingly had a floating target rigged and carried out to a distance and each day during a calm he exercised the men at it for some hours till they learnt to handle their long gun with as much ease as the carronades though we miss that mark sometimes we shall manage to hit a larger one without fail if it comes in our way my lads he sang out to encourage the crew as they were working away at it during the morning after dinner the men were allowed some time to rest and all was quiet an observation showed that the brig's position had not altered since the previous noon what do you make that out to be green asked higson the officer of the watch who had been looking through his telescope towards the shore green turned his glass in the same direction a boat and she must be coming towards us he answered after the delay of a minute or so 
higson sent him to report the circumstance to the commander who at once came on deck various were the surmises as to what could bring the boat off to them she must have had a long pull of it at all events observed higson perhaps she had the land wind which we don't feel out here said green little doubt about that she must have some urgent cause for coming out thus far to us remarked murray lower the gig mr higson and go and meet her he added immediately afterwards the people in the boat are evidently tired with their long pull and make but slow progress the gig's crew called away she was lowered and higson pulled off towards the approaching boat meantime murray walked the deck with impatient steps several times he stopped and raised his glass to his eye watching her eagerly at length he saw that the gig had reached her the two boats were alongside each other for a minute and then the gig came rowing rapidly back leaving the other behind murray watched her there must be something of importance to make higson hurry back at that rate he said to himself he has brought the people from the boat i see as the gig drew nearer he saw higson stand up and wave his handkerchief in a few minutes more she was near enough for him to distinguish those in her is it possible or do my eyes deceive me he exclaimed there's a lad in a midshipman's uniform if he is not gerald desmond he is wonderfully like him there can be little doubt who he is sir said green who was standing near his commander if that is not desmond i am a dutchman and the man sitting just abaft the stroke or is dick needham who went with the youngsters in the drodger as they are safe it is to be hoped the rest escape too i have often heard that midshipmen have as many lives as cats i trust indeed that all have been saved said murray in a grave tone he felt too anxious to joke with jos just then the gig was soon alongside and gerald desmond looking pale and exhausted was lifted on deck needham with some help managing to follow him i am truly thankful to see you desmond said murray as he took the hand of the young midshipman who was being carried aft in the arms of two of the sailors have tom and archy also been saved gerald tried to reply but no sound came from his parched throat he had barely strength to point with a finger to his lips needham was in but little better plight though he managed to murmur water water several cans full were instantly brought by eager hands stop lads you'll suffocate the poor fellows if you pour all that water down their throats exclaimed mctavish the assistant surgeon of the corvette who had been lent to the supplejack just a wine glassful at a time with a few drops of brandy in it will be the best thing for them while the surgeon was attending to his patients higson made his report to the commander he had found them both still trying to pull but so exhausted that they could scarcely move their oars no sooner did he get alongside than desmond sank down in the bottom of the boat unable to speak needham however had had strength sufficient to tell him that both the other midshipmen were alive but prisoners on shore though how they got into prison he had not said from what i could make out sir i am afraid they are not the only english in the hands of the spaniards or carthagenians or whatever the rascals call themselves continued higson i caught the words the colonel and a young lady and no time to be lost but what he wished to say more i couldn't make out only i cannot help thinking that he must have alluded to the colonel and his daughter who sailed the other day in the brig from antigua i fear that there is no doubt about it exclaimed murray greatly agitated when needham has sufficiently recovered to speak we shall learn more about the matter and be able to decide what to do stay that no time may be lost let the boats be got ready with water casks and provisions and see that the crews have their cutlasses sharpened and pistols in order should the calm continue i will lead an expedition on shore and insist on the liberation of the prisoners the sight of the british flag will probably put the dons on their good behaviour and if not we must try what force can do
i will leave you hickson in charge of the brig with twenty hands and as soon as a breeze springs up you will stand in after me and act according to circumstances i am afraid sir that if the cartagenians or whatever they call themselves are threatened with force they will retaliate on their prisoners observed hickson mongrels as they are if they have a drop of spanish blood running in their veins they would not surely injure a lady exclaimed murray not so sure of that whether whole or half-blooded spaniards are savage fellows when their temper's up answered higson however let us hope for the best all i can make out is that our friends are prisoners but the why and the wherefore i don't understand only as desmond and needham were evidently in a great hurry to get off to us i am afraid that they must be in some danger higson's remarks contributed to make murray feel more anxious even than at first the forebodings which had oppressed him since stella and her father left antigua had too probably been realized while higson issued the orders he had just received murray went up to where the young midshipmen and needham had been placed under an awning attended by the surgeon the cook had meantime been preparing some broth a few spoonsful of which as soon as they could swallow them were poured down their throats this treatment had an almost magical effect needham was soon able to sit up and speak and even gerald though his strength had been more completely prostrated recovered sufficiently soon afterwards to give a clear account of the way they had been saved and of what had afterwards happened in consequence however of murray's anxiety they narrated the latter part of their adventures first though they will be better understood if they are described in their proper sequence End of chapter ten